This video is about dairy products. I'll tell you, I didn't even realize how much there was to dairy until I started making this video. We use at least 10 different cheeses and several other dairy products too. You can make milk into lots and lots of things. Uh, I'm going to walk you through some photo galleries in a minute showing you how Parmesan and mozzarella cheeses are made. Uh, but first I just want to give you some perspective so you can see how these products are created. Uh, first of all, all these, all these products start with milk. So there are four animals that provide most of the milk in the world. The first is goats. Oh, yuck. Scratch that. No goats. Uh, we don't use any goat milk products here in the, in, the, in the pizzeria. What else have we got? Okay, we've got sheep. Sheep are cool. Sheep are actually my favorite cheeses, some of my favorite cheeses, and uh, certainly some of my favorite meats all come from sheep and lambs. Uh, love sheep. Um, what else have we got? Let's see. Next is the water buffalo. Well, what the hell is a water buffalo? Now, don't get confused uh, with the water buffalo. It's not like the American buffalo or bison. Here, look at them side by side. Totally different. The bison is huge in comparison. The water buffalo is really just a small Asian cow. Marco Polo or one of these guys went to China and brought them home to Italy, and they've got loads of them over there. Compared to the cow, the water buffalo's milk is a little tangier and a little richer, a little more fat. Uh, it makes a great mozzarella cheese, and in fact, the original tomato cheese pizzas ever made were actually made with mozzarella from water buffaloes and not from cows. So that's why we like to use it. Now, there are only a few small herds of them in the United States, so we import the cheese from Italy. Okay, so here's our team. Sheep, cows, and water buffalo. Great. This is raw milk. You can see the cream floats at the top and the skim milk is at the bottom. To get whole milk, they blend them together. Some products like whipped cream and butter start with just the cream, but most cheeses start with the whole thing. The quality of the milk is really important. It varies a lot by season. The animal feed changes. In the summer, they may be grazing on grass. In the winter, they're eating corn feed in a barn, etc. Also, the animals react to the heat just like we do. Lots of changes show up in the milk. The amount of cream and protein in the milk can, can vary by 50% depending on the season. The most important thing to know about this is that cheese making is an art. It takes a lot of experience and practice to make great cheeses and to compensate for all these variances and still get a great product out. Now, most pizza chains use shortcuts. The large industrial cheese makers make huge quantities of inexpensive cheese by using all kinds of chemicals. For example, to extend the life of fresh cheeses, which is supposed to go from the cow to the table in just a few days, they use preservatives. Uh, in contrast, to simulate the changes in texture that come with long fermentation times on aged cheeses, they just add chemicals to speed up the process. And you don't even want to know what they put in American cheese. If you ever look at a label, they call it processed cheese food. They aren't even allowed by law to straight up call it cheese anymore. At Varisanos, though, of course, we deal with some of the best producers. Let's see how great milk is transformed into great products. Now, this list is by no means comprehensive. It's just meant to give you an idea. Uh, we can add heat. We can physically handle it, such as whip it, pull it, or press it. We can add chemicals to it, such as acids or rennet. Rennet is an enzyme. It's the chemical that's in an animal's stomach that lets it process its mother's milk. Just a few drops of rennet transforms milk in seconds, as I'm going to show you. It's really the key to most cheeses. Now, aside from chemical additives, we can add biological ones. Organisms such as bacteria or mold. There are literally thousands of strains of bacteria or mold that have been added to milk, and each strain adds its own unique flavor and characteristics. I created this cool little flowchart. On the left here, we have time. Some things take just minutes, others days, months, or even years. As I mentioned, fresh cheeses, like mozzarella, should really go from the cow to the pizza in just a few days. But some of the hard cheeses are put into cheese wheels and are left to age for 18 months or even more. So, one of the easiest things that you can do is just whip it. And if you start with a high enough fat cream, you'll get whipped cream. Keep going and you get butter. Next, you could add some bacteria to it. Um, depending on the type of culture, you can get buttermilk, yogurt, or sour cream. You may not know this, but if you add some yogurt with live cultures to, uh, to milk, it'll turn the whole thing into yogurt. It'll propagate. And in theory, you can just keep going like that forever. Let's see what else. We can heat the milk and add a little acid. 
Acid does funky things to milk. Add a little vinegar or lemon juice to milk someday, and in a few seconds you will see that it begins to separate uh, into little flakes or curds. Now, if you heat milk and add a little cream of tartar, which is an acid, you can make mascarpone cheese, which is really more like a sour cream texture than a, uh, than a cheese texture. Sweetened, it's the cream that's in our tiramisu. But the real fun with milk comes when you add rennet. Remember, rennet is a chemical that the body releases in the stomach. So the first thing you do is reproduce the same conditions that are in the stomach. You heat the milk to just about body temperature, and then you add some acid. Now, in your stomach, there's hydrochloric acid, but cheesemakers usually add citric acid or vinegar, or sometimes they add bacteria and weight, because as the bacteria eat the sugars in the milk, they convert them into acids. It takes half a day for the milk to sour usually, but this is the old school way it was done. Once the milk is warm and acidic, in comes the rennet. Now, we've had vegetarian customers ask us about our rennet. In the old days, they'd get rennet by rinsing out the stomach of a pig or a cow. But nowadays, it's usually derived from plant sources. I've tried to go through our cheeses and verify that they are all from vegetable sources. Our cow's milk mozzarella and our ricotta are both definitely vegetable rennet. The others are from Europe and don't exactly specify. Okay, let's go through some photos. Here, some acid is being added to milk as it heats up to body temperature. Here, the same thing is being done on a commercial scale. If you get the milk hot enough, just the acid alone will cause it to separate. But now she's pouring in the rennet. In just a few seconds, look what happens. It separates. The curd is the solid white part, and the whey is that green gray watery stuff left behind. At this point the curd feels kind of like jello. Um, now they need to strain out the water but a lot of it is locked in those little jello cubes so the next step is to take a big knife and to cut it up and help it drain. She's doing it by hand. Here a big machine is doing it and another. And then it's agitated just a bit um, just to kind of shake it up and shake some of that water out. And finally, it's time to start scooping out the curd. This is actually a photo of me scooping out some curd out of a big vat. Here's a good shot of what it looks like right after it comes out. It looks a lot like cottage cheese, and it's actually pretty close to that. Okay, so back to the flowchart. Rennet causes the curd and the whey to separate. Now what? Well, we have a lot of options. Let's continue looking at how we go from curd to making a wheel of cheese, such as a big wheel of Swiss cheese or Parmesan cheese. This is actually a factory where we're making Parmesan cheese. On top of the way, you can see that it's turned yellow. That's the butter fat uh, that came out when we cut the curds. Uh, whey came out, but also some of the uh, butter fat came out, and that yellow floated up to the top. Now, they pull the curd up into cheesecloth, and then they hang it and let it drain. Or, they can put it in buckets like these. Can you see the holes in the sides where the water is flowing out? If they really let it sit and drain, it can get quite dry, like these curds here. But, these Parmesan makers are doing it a bit different. They are scooping the curd out into cloth, and then directly into buckets. Then they let them sit and drain a bit, and then put them through a press to squeeze out as much water as they can. Now you can see it's pretty dry and solid. It's actually holding together by itself now. Cheese usually has a rind. Can you see that the last half inch of the cheese is a different color? And then of course in the back you see words printed on it. You can see it more clearly here all around the bottom and the right side, the colors change. There are a lot of kinds of rinds on cheese. Uh, some wheels are covered in a wax rind, others with mold, uh, which gradually eat into the cheese and give it a different flavor. This Parmesan wheel uh, is not covered, though. Instead, the outer half inch of the curd dries out so much that it forms, that it kind of transforms from cheese into a rind. Some guy on the internet created this chart showing all different types of rinds. Our Parmesan cheese wheels are floated in heavily salted water, and this starts the formation of the rind. 
Each wheel is then pressed firmly into a mold to be stamped. Europeans love stamping things. This form repeats the phrase Parmigiano Reggiano. Also, a unique four-digit number is pressed into each wheel. Notice how the middle circle here is left blank. That's for more stamps later. So, they press the stamps on. Now the wheels are washed in brine again and stored by the thousand. And every few months they take them down and send them through this washer to make sure no funky organisms penetrate the rind. Then back on the shelf again. And finally, like a year and a half to three years later, some old guy checks it and says it's good, and it gets its next stamp. And here are a few more stamps. Can you see the one that says upside down DOP? That's kind of a big deal in Europe. It means designated origin protected. You can't make Parmesan cheese outside of Parma without some Italian bureaucrat with a voodoo doll wishing you dead or something. Champagne has to come from the Champagne region of France. Feta cheese has to come from Greece. San Marzano tomatoes have to come from the San Marzano Valley. It's like a trademark. It's good, though. We use very authentic products. But not just for the sake of authenticity. We use them because they do tend to live up to their reputations. This is a perfect wheel of Parmigiano. When you chip at this cheese, it creates a distinctive crumble. It's usually a good sign of a good Parm wheel. This next cheese is Pecorino Romano. Pecorino means sheep, and Romano is just Rome, so this is a Roman sheep's milk cheese. It's made very similar to the Parmesan. It's just slightly lighter in color, and it's a bit softer. Um, both, are very, both are really excellent cheeses. Now, of course, since one's made with cow's milk and the other's with sheep's milk, um, they do have a, a little bit different flavor to them. And um, we like to do that. We like to have uh, several different varieties of similar but not quite the same ingredient in the same dish because it adds a little bit more depth of flavor. Now, both cheeses are very salty because of all the brining, and most of our red pies have one or both of these cheeses grated on top, and one of our pies actually has a third similar cheese uh, grated on top of it as well. Um, now, the more these cheese wheels age, the drier they get. Some of our cheeses go through many of the same steps, but are not aged quite as long, and these end up being firm, but not quite dry enough and not quite hard enough to grate. We use three different firm cheeses. Now, they all look the same, or somewhat similar, um, and they're all somewhat similar in texture also, so sometimes they're kind of hard to tell apart. Um, but, of course, they all use their own particular uh, bacteria cultures, and they all have different tastes. Uh, the mildest is Fontal. It's also the lightest in color. Um, it's a little more sweet, uh, and texture-wise, it's a little bit more rubbery. Uh, it's aged about two months. We use it on our dessert pizza. It pairs very well with the honey. It's also on the mushroom pizza, the Fontina mushroom pizza, of course, um, because it melts very softly, and with all the juice that comes out of the mushrooms, it kind of mixes with the cheese and forms a little sauce. It, it's, really, it's really quite nice pairing. Um, the middle one is the Emmentaler. Uh, it's either called Emmental, sometimes it's called Emmental. Uh, it's from Switzerland. It's aged about three to four months. There are versions of it that are aged as long as two years, uh, although that's not the ones that we use. Um, it's a bit sharper, but it doesn't really uh, overpower the other flavors in, in, in dishes. Um, sometimes we kind of use it as a middle cheese. So, for example, on dessert pizza, we don't want something quite as soft as the Fontal, so we add a little of the Emmental to bring it up. And, um, and then we have another cheese that's much sharper, and we use a little of the Emmental to cut it back. So it's kind of that middle of the row. We use it to balance our dishes out. Um, um, it's on the onion pie. That's probably where it uh, shines the best is on the uh, caramelized onion pie. Um, my favorite cheese actually is the sharpest one. That's the Pirano. Uh, it's aged about five months. It's definitely a little drier than the others. Um, it's, uh, it's much sharper. Uh, it's great paired with flavors in the stronger pizzas, like the Nucci pizza, which has salty olives and lots of garlic and herbs and meats. So uh, a weaker cheese would kind of get lost in all of that. Uh, the Pirano holds up very well. It's also just a great eating cheese. You can just cut off pieces of Pirano cheese and eat them with a piece of bread and a little... Uh, sun-dried tomato or even a little bit of mustard on it or something. It's, it's a very, very, very good cheese. It's very versatile. 
and compare with a lot of foods. Um, if you look on the line, you can see that all three look similar, but they are different and they are matched with their respective dishes pretty well.